بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله النبي الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome all of you brothers and sisters to the second episode in this series Diaries of an Exorcist In the first episode we gave a brief introduction as to the benefits of studying such a topic and bringing this to the attention of the community and we looked at the first case of the sister who was about 55 years old and she was possessed by the Sikh jinn but this one Qadr Allah was the one that got away Khair insha'Allah today in this episode we're going to look at two things or two separate cases the first case which I'm going to mention to you today is the case of a young brother this young brother, he is approximately 14 years old. He's about 14 to 15 years old. And I got a phone call from the masjid and they said, Akhi, are you around? And there was a, a conference going on in the masjid at the time. Some scholars had come from various parts of the world and there was a conference going on at the time. And this brother had been found outside and he was trying to strangle himself. Subhanallah, this brother with his own two hands was trying to strangle himself to death. And alhamdulillah, the security and the volunteers from the masjid, they managed to stop the brother and he passed out. And there was a good brother from the community and he began reciting, began making ruqya on this brother. And the brother passed out, so he was carried into the masjid reception, away from you know, the general public. There he was lying and I walked in and I saw him and one of the shuyukh was uh, reciting over him at the time. One of the shuyukh was reciting over him at the time, Ikhwani, but the sheikh's lecture now, it was next and he said, look, you need to take over. So I took over and I continued with the recitation. Uh, didn't do anything in particular, nothing special. Started with some adhkar started with some adhkar and then went on to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and then after Surah Al-Fatiha recited the opening of Surah Al-Baqarah then recited uh, the Ayatul Kursi then recited the last couple of ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah then I think I was reciting uh, Surah As-Safat the 37th Surah of the Quran and all of the while this brother he was lying down and his eyes were asleep and his eyes were closed and he was looked like he was unconscious he looked like he was unconscious and subhanallah all of a sudden this brother he was lying down on the floor back on the floor and he just got up he sprung up with you know a lot of force and the jinn said ah, I'm going to kill him I'm going to kill him this was the first thing that came out of the mouth of this boy and the voice wasn't the, the normal voice of a boy, it was a very croaky, very deep voice. And the voice said, I'm going to kill him. And so I said, what are you going to kill him for? What's the problem? Why are you going to kill this 14-year-old child? And the jinn told us, this boy killed my children. This boy killed my children. So what do you mean he killed my ch your children? And the jinn said, well, he stepped on my kids. He stepped on my kids and I thought, okay, subhanallah, now we have the reason why this brother is trying to strangle himself to death. This is the reason why he's trying, it seems like he's trying to end his own life. Ikhwani, subhanallah, subhanallah, what's happened is this brother was going somewhere and he's killed the children of this jinn and now the jinn wants revenge and now the jinn will not stop until he kills this boy he kills this boy but subhanallah to everybody else it would look like suicide so I said to this jinn I said yeah jinni are you a Muslim are you a Muslim and the jinn said yes I'm a Muslim yes I'm a Muslim because I thought subhanallah we're in a masjid right now we're in a masjid right now there's angels around us bi'idhnillahi ta'ala you know, we are surrounded with the mercy of Allah. They, there is dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembrance of Allah going on. It's very unlikely that this jinn is going to be able to even enter into the masjid if it's a non-Muslim jinn. So I said to the jinn, Ya jinni, are you Muslim? And the jinn said, yes, I'm a Muslim. 
So then I reminded the jinn about Yawm Al-Qiyamah. I said to the jinn, you have no right to be in this person. You have no right to be trying to take his life. He is the slave of Allah. What are you going to say to Allah? Who will defend you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Who is going to defend you from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala on the Day of Judgment? Yawm La Yanfa'u Malun Wa La Banun. The day on which your wealth and your children are not going to benefit you. Who is going to defend you? Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, alhamdulillah, the jinn screamed and the boy's body it lifted up and then it dropped back down and the jinn left. And the jinn left and the, the jinn, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't returned since then. Walhamdulillah. The boy's friends were around. I said, tell me. You guys must have been playing in a park somewhere. Or you must have been pl playing after Maghrib sometime. And they said, you know what? We, I, and I initially thought maybe they were young lads, they were playing football. So maybe they kicked the ball and the ball hit one of the kids or it, it, you know, it killed the kids. But they told me, they made me aware that this boy, on his way home, on his way home, he takes a shortcut through the park. He takes a shortcut through the park. And so, he doesn't walk through the park, he runs through the park and sometimes it's after Maghrib, sometimes it's late at night. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best but what it seems, what happened was, this boy was running home through the park one night and he stepped on one of the, uh, one of the jinni's children and he killed them or a group of them and he killed them. And so the jinn wanted revenge for that. And that's how he killed the, uh, the children of the jinn. And another amazing thing, the friends they were telling us that they were hanging around the park and this was I think a couple of nights uh, prior to this incident. They were hanging around the park and this boy was absolutely fine, he was in the park. Suddenly he lowered his head and he raised his eyes, turns to one of his friends and says, I'm going to kill you. He turns to his friend and tells his friend he's going to kill him. And he chases his friend all around the park. So the friend is running frantically for his life and this boy is chasing his own friend, seemingly. So the boy runs down the road and he runs into the masjid. The boy runs into the masjid, subhanAllah. And his friend, this child who is possessed, he is chasing him. When he gets to the doors of the masjid, he stops. He stops and doesn't take a single step forward. It's like he's hit a brick wall. He stops at the doors of the masjid and begins screaming, I'm going to get you, I'm coming for you. But he doesn't follow him into the masjid. And one of the brothers who was walking behind him, he pushed the child into the masjid. As soon as he pushed him into the masjid, Ikhwani, the child came back to his senses. It's like subhanAllah, you know, when you, uh, before you enter, wherever it might be, you take your coat off, you leave it at the door and then you enter. The same way, it's like subhanAllah, that jinni, that shaitan, whatever it was, couldn't enter into the masjid because at that stage it wanted to kill him and it was so intent on killing him, it couldn't enter into the masjid. It couldn't enter into the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so subhanAllah, we find, ikhwani, there are various lessons from this story. One of the lessons, Ikhwani, is a practical lesson for each and every single one of us. How many times, how many times does one of us throw something across the room, whether it be a cushion, whether it be our shoes, our clothes, whatever it might be, whatever it might be, we just throw it and we don't care. Ikhwani, I've had so many stories, I've had so many stories and witnessed myself these things that you threw. How do you know that there's not a jinn sitting there? How do you know that there's not a jinn sitting and you've just hit that jinn? And now your problems begin. And we find that the jinn are not necessarily the most intellectual of, cre of creatures. They're very strong, they're very able physically, but in terms of their intellect, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most of them don't have a lot of intellect, ikhwani. So you will do something small to them. You didn't know that he was sitting there. You threw something across the room. You hit the jinn and, you know, caused a bit of pain. And now he wants to try and cause you to kill yourself. Now he wants to make your life a misery. You know, the punishment is not in line and it is not, um, you know, at the same amount as the, you know, the mistake that you made. So the ratio is hugely skewed. 
So Ikhwani, before you do anything, don't just be throwing things across the room in your house. Don't just be, you know, uh, acting in this way because you don't know. These, this is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we simply cannot see. So if we can't see them, then we have to be very careful. So if you need to throw something, say Bismillah. Make this announcement that, look, I'm going to throw something. Say Bismillah before you throw it across the room. Say Bismillah before you throw it down the stairs. Say Bismillah. Mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah this will protect you. Another point of benefit, ikhwani, for those people who might potentially be doing ruqya. When you are coming across, when you come across a jinn that is Muslim, I found that it's a lot easier to bargain with them, to remind them and to get them to leave with the permission of Allah. Why? Because they are Muslim. So if you ever come across a Muslim jinn, tell him to fear Allah. Tell him to remember Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Remind him that he is going to die. The same way, Ikhwani, when we remind our brothers and sisters from among the human beings, if they're committing a sin, we say to them, look, ittaqillah, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, Allah is going to hold you accountable on the Day of Judgment. The same way, Ikhwani, when we come across the, uh, the Muslims from amongst the jinn, and there are Muslims from amongst the jinn, then Ikhwani, remind them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It won't always work. Just like there are mischievous people who are Muslim, you remind them about the Day of Judgment, but they don't really care, they're not bothered. The same way, Ikhwani, there are Muslims from amongst the jinn, from amongst the, uh, the, the creation of the jinn. So remind them about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remind them about the reason for their creation, and inshallah, you will find that they are a lot easier to deal with than the non-Muslim jinn. They are a lot easier to deal with than the non-Muslim jinn. The non-Muslim jinn are extremely stubborn and, you know, subhanAllah, it's very difficult to deal with them. So this is the case of this brother. This is the case of this brother and I want to mention one final thing, Ikhwani, as a side note. But we spoke to the dad, we spoke to the father of this child afterwards. And the father said, you know, I was making dua against my son. I was making dua against my son because he doesn't listen to me. And he disobeys me. So I was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach him a lesson. I was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to punish him. And look how Allah azza wa jal punished. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered the dua of this father. And this boy, he went through all of this suffering. Ikhwani, we need to obey our parents and fear the dua of our parents against us, Ikhwani. Make them make dua for us and not against us. So this is the... First case that I'd like to mention to you brothers and sisters today. As for the second case, Ikhwani, this is my favorite case. This is... Separate one. No, the same one. Same episode. Yeah, same episode. As for the second case, Ikhwani, this is my favorite case. This is, I think, my most rewarding case. And this is the case which, subhanAllah, there are a huge number of benefits that we can derive from this incident that transpired. The brother, and it was a brother, he was approximately 35 years old. Approximately 35 years old and he rang me. And he rang me, uh, initially it was him and then his wife rang me and they told me about their situation. They told me about their situation, how he has these fits, how he cries, how um, the wife said it's very difficult for her in the marriage, all of these things. And I didn't listen to too much before I knew that, look, I need to go down. Um, and we need to make ruqya on this brother. So we went down to this brother and we made ruqya on him. Now I took a, another brother with me and we were sat with this brother and I was sat opposite him and I began with the uh, recitation and I started making the azkar first and then we started after that with the recitation. We started with Surah Al-Fatiha. If I remember correctly, I think we recited that three times. Then we recited the um, opening of Surah Al-Baqarah. Then we recited the Ayatul Kursi. Then the last two of Surah Al-Baqarah. And then we started mentioning some other ayat from the Quran. Ikhwani, while we were there, while we were reciting, the brother he was picking things from his arm. So we were just sat there making recitation of Quran and the brother was sat there and he would pick things and he would look at his arm and he would bang his arm and then it was like he was picking something from his arm, pulling something from his arm and then he would throw it. 
he would throw it. And there was even times when while we were reciting Ikhwani, the brother would pick something off his arm, he would go outside of his house and he would throw something out of his uh, front door and then he would come and he would sit back down. He said, Akhi, what are you doing? What are you picking off your arm? And the brother said, there are big spiders and they are crawling all over me. I can see spiders and they are crawling all over me. What I'm doing is I'm picking them off and I'm throwing them outside. So I said, okay. And the brother told us about what he was doing himself. What he was doing of Rukia on himself before this, uh, you know, this incident where we met the brother. So the brother, he informed us how for one month, Ikhwani, one whole month, the brother locked himself in his living room. He locked himself in his living room and he ate nothing except for water and uh, soup. All day, every single day, Ikhwani, the brother, he would recite Quran upon himself. He would um, listen to Quran. He would pray. He would offer his voluntary prayers. Ikhwani, this brother was doing so much ruqya on himself. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. But the brother now explained, I'm at a stage where I can't do it anymore. I'm so weak. He'd lost so much weight. And he was a big brother, but he was so weak. He'd lost so much weight, Ikhwani, and he was, you know, looked like he was on the verge of collapsing. But we still said, Ikhwani, no, MashaAllah, you're doing very well. What you've done for the last month, carry on and inshaAllah you will heal yourself. Ikhwani, a point of benefit here. If a person is making ruqya on themselves, this is the best form of ruqya. This is the best form of ruqya. Why? They are seeking the cure themselves. They are putting their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't need anybody else to come and make ruqya on them. So, Ikhwani, when I go to somebody and they're telling me they're making ruqya, I step away and I say, continue with your ruqya. Do what you can and get to the furthest stage that you're able to and just keep going. Keep going. And if you find that you can't do any more, then call me back. And then I will take the baton and I will take it forward with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Ikhwani, whatever situation you're suffering from, don't pick up the phone straight away. And, you know, call somebody and say, help me. The best thing to do, Ikhwani, is that we make ruqya upon ourselves. This is the best thing and this is most pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal if we put our complete trust, our complete tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and we seek the cure directly from Allah Azza wa Jal without calling anybody else and asking them to recite on us. Obviously, if you're not able to recite yourself, this is a different issue. So we left this brother and I remember... Uh, saying to the, my companion, I remember saying to him, Alhamdulillah, I don't think we're needed here. Alhamdulillah, I don't think we're needed here because the brother, MashaAllah, good strong brother in Iman, in knowledge, he's doing everything himself. So Alhamdulillah, we parted ways and that was what I thought would be the last that I would hear from this brother who was suffering. Ikhwani, subhanAllah, the next day he rang me. The next day he rang me and it sounded like he was about to die. It sounded like he was taking his last breaths. And he said, Brother Hasnain, you need to come. Please come. It's come and it's come back and it's so big, it's so strong. I have no control over this whatsoever. I said, Akhi, okay, don't worry, calm down, relax. Take it easy, we'll be there this evening, inshallah. So I took uh, two other brothers with me. And when I go, Ikhwani for Rukya, I do my best to take two or three brothers with me, two or three different brothers each time. But those brothers have to be good practicing brothers because what you don't want to do is you're making ruqya on a person and if there is a jinn, the jinn leaps from that person into one of you and a'udhu billah. You need to take good strong brothers, take the precautions, make your adhkar, put your trust in Allah and then proceed ahead. So I took these two brothers um, and we went and I started with the recitation. Ikhwani, about 10 minutes into the recitation, the brother started crying. He started crying profusely. He was crying and he was crying and he was crying. And at this stage, you know that there's a jinn now. You know that there's a jinn now. Because this brother was quite a big broad brother. But subhanAllah, when the jinn came out, when the jinn manifested itself and started crying, his frame, his whole, his, the whole structure of his body changed. And subhanAllah, you might think, you know, how is it that the person's nose is in the same place, his eyes are the same, his mouth is the same, but he looks like a different person. How is that possible? All I can say, Ikhwani, is that when a person becomes extremely angry, 
you see that a different expression takes on their face. It looks like a different person. The same way, Ikhwani, when somebody is possessed and the jinn manifests itself, although all of the hardware is the same, the nose is the same, the mouth is the same, the eyes, the ears, everything is the same, the way everything is, subhanAllah, the person just takes on a different complexion, the color of their skin changes, their face changes, and it looks like a different person, and their body changes as well. Now you know you're not dealing with that brother, now you know you're dealing with the jinn. So Ikhwani, when the jinn came out, then we beat the jinn. We beat the jinn, but Ikhwani, disclaimer here now. When I say we beat the jinn, beating the jinn is not the same as beating the human being. So if somebody was to ask me, how do we beat the jinn? I would say it's enough for us to take a key, like a car key, or the, door, the, the key to your front door, and just press it gently against the sole of that person's foot. What the human being would find ticklish, and he might laugh and he might pull his foot away because he finds it ticklish, you will cause agony to the shaitan. This will cause agony to the jinn. Take your finger and just poke them lightly in the stomach. Poke them lightly in the stomach so that if you were to poke a baby with the same strength, the baby wouldn't be harmed, it, wouldn't, it would just laugh, it would, it would find it ticklish. But when you tickle or when you do that and you poke the shaitan, you poke the jinn, and you say Bismillah while you're doing it, Ikhwani, it's like stabbing them in the stomach. The same thing, Ikhwani, is if you just, you know, the, uh, the traps here, these muscles next to the neck, Ikhwani, and on the tops of the shoulders, just give them a light squeeze. So like you're, like you're massaging somebody, and the person is enjoying this massage, it's, it's, you know, relaxing them. But when you do it to the jinn, Ikhwani, give it a little squeeze, and subhanAllah, you will find that they will start screaming. Ikhwani, we have all heard the horror stories of people who have killed somebody and then they have said, well, we were performing exorcism. We were, you know, uh, this person was possessed. Ikhwani, subhanallah, subhanallah, we only should do that which we are comfortable with. Ikhwani, if somebody is possessed and you break their neck, the person is going to die. You're not going to harm the jinn. You may harm the jinn, but you've killed the person as well. Ikhwani, if the jinn is there, you are 100% sure that it's the jinn and you take a sword and you chop the person's head off. Is that person going to stay alive? The answer is no. We have to use our common sense, Ikhwani. If you are strangling somebody and you think you're strangling the jinn and you break the person's windpipe, Ikhwani, subhanallah, then you can't blame anybody else for your own ignorance. So Ikhwani, only do this with the person's permission, number one that they are, permiss they, they are allowing you to make ruqya on them and they have given you permission that look, if it comes to it, you can give me a little poke here and there. And Ikhwani number two and number three, know that when you are doing this, you're not harming the person, you are harming the jinn. And this comes with experience. It's not for everybody to use beating and these techniques. This comes with experience, Ikhwani. So know that you are doing it to the jinn and not to the person. Because how many a time do you, are you doing it and then the person says, look, it's me. And you go and you punch them in the face and you say, shut up, shaitan. And you've just broken his jaw because it was the brother and it wasn't the jinn. You have to be able to recognize the difference, ikhwani. You have to be able to tell, this is the person, this is the jinn now. So we gave the jinn a good beating, ikhwani, but we didn't beat or cause harm to the brother with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the brother gave his full permission. He said, Akhi, you do what you like. But again, we kept it within those limits. And you brothers and sisters should do the same. And you should also know, Ikhwani, that Quran is 99% of what you should be reciting. If you find yourself going to make ruqya on somebody and you take a baseball bat and you take a chain and you take a knife, Ikhwani, you're not doing ruqya, you're about to commit murder. So what you should do, the Qur'an should form 99% of your session. And just to top it up, you can give the odd beating here and there. But like I said, keep it within reason. Don't harm the person and do it in such a way that if the person is, if it's the person that you're doing it to and you've got it wrong and it's not the jinn, that you're not going to cause any harm to the brother or sister that you are doing the ruqya on. So this session, Ikhwani, we gave the jinn a good beating. Again, the jinn a good beating, not the brother who we were doing the ruqya upon. We gave the jinn a good 
hard beating Ikhwani when combined with the Quran. So we were reciting Quran, we were beating the jinn, I took some scent with me as well, we were putting that under the person's nose and the jinn was really crying and he was taking a good beating, Alhamdulillah. Ikhwani then subhanallah, now the tricks begin. And the jinn says, stop, 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 I've become a Muslim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolah. And he was speaking, the brother is from Africa, the jinn was speaking with a Caribbean accent. Allahu alam if he was a West Indian jinn, Allah knows best. So the, the jinn says, I've become a Muslim. Stop, 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 stop. So we stopped and we said, okay, you've become a Muslim, now you need to leave. Now you need to leave. And so the brother, the jinn would say, right, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Okay, I'm going out of that window over there. And the brother would run over to the window and he would go, and he would blow as hard as he could, ikhwani. It was like, it was subhanAllah, the strength of that blowing, the, the amount of wind that was coming out of his mouth was just amazing, ikhwani. And it was lasting for minutes on end. It wasn't normal, it wasn't human, ikhwani. And then the brother would go, alhamdulillah. And we would say, okay, the brother is back now. But then I would say to the brother, now, right, Akhi, I've recited. You, for the last month, have been reciting so much Qur'an. Now I want you to recite. Like I said, it's always better if the person recites themselves. So, Ikhwani, Wallahi, he would say, he would begin with his recitation. And he would say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And then he would say, Alif Lam. And he couldn't even say Meem. He couldn't even say Meem. Ikhwani, Subhanallah. He would get and he would say Alif Lam and then he would start crying and the jinn would say leave me alone, what are you doing etc. And he was just a bit of a coward to be, to be fair. Khair. So the brother couldn't recite. As soon as he would try to recite the jinn would come back. And we were amazed, we'd say you, you jinn you're a liar. He said no, no look I've become a Muslim, I want to leave, I want to leave. So then I thought okay, how am I going to find out now that this jinn is telling the truth and he's not just a liar. Because most of them are liars. So I said to him, I said, Jinni, tell me, we are created from clay and altered mud. Tell me, you're created from water, aren't you, Jinn? And the Jinn said, yes, 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 I'm created from water, I'm created from water. And I said, liar. I said, you're a liar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa khalaq al jannah min marijim min nar. That we created the Jinn from a smokeless flame of fire. So I said, you are a liar. You are a liar. We don't accept your testimony of faith. We don't accept that you're going to leave. We're just going to kill you now. And we carried on with the recitation. And Ikhwani, we stayed there for about two to three hours. And we really gave the brother or the jinn a good hard beating. A good hard beating. And the jinn was crying. And the jinn was trying everything and anything to stop us from, uh, recite, from reciting, he wanted to talk, he said, oh, there's nine of them now. He was saying that there's nine jinn in the side, inside this man's body. There's nine of us now, and then the brother would run to the window and blow, and then he would say, right, there's eight of us now, and then there's seven of us now, there's six, there's five, there's four, there's three, there's two. Oh, I'm the single jinn left now. Subhanallah. And we didn't really take any notice. We just continued with the recitation. Anyway, it got late, so I said to the brother, I'll see you tomorrow, insha'Allah. I'll come down tomorrow. So, Ikhwani, that was that. I was at work the next day and the brother rang me. The brother rang me and it was himself. How are you, Akhi? Yeah, very well. How's things? Yeah, I'm okay. And then the brother asked me a question. Are you going to come tonight? Are you going to come this evening? And I said, yes, insha'Allah. We will be there this evening. Ikhwani, over the phone, over the telephone, Immediately it switched and now I'm speaking to the jinn. And the jinn says, no, please don't come tonight. The jinn says, please don't come tonight. Don't you have work? You're going to get home. You're going to be tired. Why don't you go home and go to sleep? Please don't come. Please don't beat me. And I said to the, uh, to the jinn, I said, Jinni, I'm coming for you tonight. And I put the phone down. Ikhwani, a point of benefit here. Notice how the jinn tried to make us think, you know, oh, I'm tired, I will go another day, you know, we don't need to go tonight, we just went yesterday, and etc, etc. And this is how they whisper to us, Ikhwani, the same way when we want to read Quran, mm, I'm tired, you know, if I don't sleep, if I don't sleep now, I'm going to wake up late for work, I'm going to miss work in the morning, etc, etc. 
He tried this same thing, but only, you know, when it happens with us, Ikhwani, uh, it, you know, it's whispers from shaitan. But now I've got shaitan or one of the shayateen telling me directly, why don't you go home and rest, go to sleep, etc., etc. I said, I'll see you tonight. I'll see you tonight. And so we went down that evening, Ikhwani. We walked through the door. We walked through the door. The brother sat down and it was the brother. And then I sat down and the brothers sat down. And we didn't even start with the recitation except that the jinn started crying. The jinn started crying before we even recited because he knew what was about to come. He knew he was going to get a good hard beating again. And so the jinn was crying. We continued with the recitation. We started the recitation and the jinn, he stopped us and said, Look, I've, I've been here for two years. I've been here for two years trying to separate this man from his wife. So the jinn stops us and says, and the jinn is crying and the jinn is in, you know, is, is in a state of desperation. Two years I've been trying to separate this man from his wife. And the jinn said, I haven't been able to do anything because this man has a white heart. This brother's heart is white. So what do you mean his heart is white? He said he's a good person. He's a good person. He leads his wife in prayer. He reads Quran and he reads his prayers. This is a good person. I haven't been able to do what I was sent to do. So we asked the jinn, Who sent you? Ya Khabith, oh you filth. Who sent you? Who sent you? And the brother told, this jinn told us that this brother's aunt in Africa, this brother's aunt in Africa, his own auntie did magic on him and the magic was in his stomach and the way it got into his stomach was when this brother visited Africa, the auntie, she put uh, magic into the brother's lemonade. And the brother and the jinn even told us what type of drink it was. She put magic into this drink and he drank it and I've been here ever since. I've been here ever since and I haven't been able to do anything because he's a good brother. Ikhwani subhanallah, subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when talking about magic, وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ That when talking about the magic and the magicians and the, their plot, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but they do not harm anybody except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah azza wa jal had decreed that this jinn wouldn't be able to separate his husband, the, 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 the husband from his wife. And so, ikhwani, we continued with the beating. One technique that we used, uh, was I stood in front of the brother and one brother was to the left and one brother was to the right. I would make the Adhan and they hate the Adhan. The Shayateen, they hate the Adhan. As the Prophet ﷺ told us that when the Adhan is called, Shaitan flees. Shaitan flees when the Adhan is called. So we called the Adhan and he didn't want to listen. And then I got the brother on the right hand side. I said, you make the Adhan into his right ear. So the brother made the Adhan into his right ear. Then as soon as he finished, I said, now Akhi, you make the Adhan into his left ear. And he would make the Adhan into his left ear. Then when he would finish, I would make the Adhan straight in front of him. So the Adhan was coming from all angles, Ikhwani. We wouldn't stop except that the jinn would be begging us, leave me alone, I will go now, I will go now, just leave me alone. Ikhwani, we continued like this for ages and ages and ages. And on top of that, we use water. So what we would do is um, we would, uh, you know, subhanAllah, I don't know the effect of water, what, it, what effect it has, why it has this effect, Allahu Alam. But from experience, what we can say is that there are some jinnis who you'll spray them and they'll just sit there and they'll take it. However, there are others from amongst the jinn. When you spray them, it's like that water, ikhwani, just normal water. It's like that water is like acid and it burns them and they scream. But Ikhwani, again, let me remind you, the Qur'an should form 99% of your attack on the, on the shayateen or 99% of your ruqya session. And 1% should be these other subsidiary things and these are just secondary issues. The primary thing that you do, Ikhwani, is you should be reciting Qur'an. Ikhwani, an amazing thing transpired when, uh, when I was reciting I want to share it with you because subhanallah, you know, we know that the jinn are real. We believe in the jinn. We believe in the world of the shaitan. Uh, we believe in the world of the unseen. We believe in the Quran. But ikhwani, we experienced this. We actually experienced the strength of the Quran by the permission of Allah. We were reciting and then I started reciting Surah as safat I don't know what effect Oh, I don't know why this surah has such a huge effect, but it seems that Ikhwani, this surah, it really 
terrorizes and it really causes immense pain and problems for the shayateen. It's the 37th surah of the Qur'an. So we were reciting Surah as safat as safa was safat as safa and we were reciting, reciting, reciting and the jinn started screaming. And the jinn said, it's burning me, it's burning me, it's burning me. And the jinn said, everywhere that I look, there is fire. Subhanallah. Ikhwani, we were in the same room. We did not see any fire. We did not see anything. But the shaitan, he was saying, everywhere that I turn, there is fire all around me and it is burning me. Ikhwani, this is the strength of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't truly, un we don't truly appreciate this Qur'an which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَعَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِّنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ That had we revealed this Qur'an on a mountain, you would see the mountain humbled and exploding out of the fear of Allah. Ikhwani, this Qur'an which if it was revealed to a mountain, the mountain would turn to dust out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why don't we utilize it more? Why don't we make it a part of our lives? So Ikhwani, we continued that night and we made a huge amount of ruqya or we made a lengthy period of ruqya. I would make ruqya and then I would tell the other brothers, I would take a rest and they would make ruqya. The other brother would take a rest and the other brother would make ruqya. And Ikhwani, what was my purpose for doing this? Not only was it to take a rest, but it was to show to the brothers that there's nothing special about doing ruqya. If you can recite Qur'an, you can do ruqya at least on yourself and your family. Not necessarily on the wider community, but if you can recite Qur'an, if your aqidah is correct, you have the capability to make ruqya, ikhwani. You have the capability to make ruqya and you shouldn't shy away from it. You shouldn't shy away from it because this is seeking cure for all of our illnesses and it will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we sought cure from a haram way, would we be punished? Of course we would. So what about when we seek it through a halal way? Of course we expect a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ikhwani, this was the, I think this was the, the third time that I visited the brother and we were making ruqya. And, the, and you know, the jinn was saying, okay, I'm going now. And again, he was blowing out and immense, immense blows, Ikhwani. The, the, how much wind was coming out of this brother's mouth. It, is, it wasn't human. It wasn't normal. It was not normal. And then, Ikhwani, subhanAllah, the jinn would, his, the brothers, again, the hardware is the same. His arms are the same. His shoulders are the same. His face is the same. Everything is the same. But then his posture would change and his voice would change. And the jinn would say, now I'm a different jinn. That one has gone, now there's another one. I'm a different one. I am this one and this is this one, this one, this one, this one. And they told us their names. Again, it's not useful. I can't remember their names, Ikhwani. And then an amazing thing happened. Then an amazing thing happened. The brother suddenly, it was the brother again. And you can tell when it's the brother. And it was the brother and he started crying. And he started crying and he started glorifying and praising and you know asking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he made the prostration of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was crying in his prostration, Ikhwani. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured the brother. And walhamdulillah, Ikhwani, I never saw the, this brother in the masjid before this time. I never saw the brother in the, in the masjid before this time. But recently this Ramadan, I saw the brother and I used to meet him virtually every single night of Taraweeh and he was in the masjid and he was praying and Ikhwani, he would tell me that when he came to England before he came, he used to be very close to the Qur'an. His relationship with the Qur'an used to be very strong. But when he came to England and he got involved in the fitna and the fasad, he went away from the Qur'an. But walhamdulillah, Ikhwani, since then, the brother has become a strongly practicing brother. He reads Qur'an, he makes ruqya on himself and his family. The brother has um, volunteered. He said, when you go and make ruqya, if you need somebody to come, I will come any and every single time. And we see the brother in the masjid. Walhamdulillah, Ikhwani, a point of benefit here. At that moment, when the brother couldn't recite Alif, Lam, Meem, his life was at a very low stage. He was feeling low, he had no energy, he was dreaming of snakes, he would see things, he would experience things, he couldn't recite the Qur'an anymore. Ikhwani, this was a very low point. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْعُصْرِ yusra." That indeed, with every hardship, there comes ease. Ikhwani, now the brother, alhamdulillah, is going through a period of ease and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease the situations of all of the Muslims, wherever they are. Other things, other points of benefit. I gave the brother or I told the brother to um, take some laxatives. Because the magic was in his stomach, Ikhwani, when the magic gets into your stomach, it doesn't matter how many times you empty your bowels, you empty your stomach, the magic, it just has a way, by the permission of Allah, of staying in the person's stomach. It stays in the person's stomach. So what we did was we gave him some uh, advice to take some laxatives and alhamdulillah, this cleared out the magic from his system. I did go a couple of other times and there was remnants of the jinn after that, but alhamdulillah, um, I went abroad and I came back and the brother was completely cured by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another point of benefit, Ikhwani, like I said, the brother couldn't recite Alif Lam Meem. So he would recite Alif Lam and he would stop. And then we would beat the jinn, we would make more ruqya and then I would say, now Akhi recite. And he would be able to recite Alif Lam Meem, Thalikal. And then the jinn would come up again, start laughing or start crying or start screaming and we would beat the jinn again, again I emphasize beat the jinn, not beat the brother. We would beat the jinn again, we would make more ruqya and then we would continue and the brother would now be able to recite Alif la Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه But he couldn't go on. So it's like subhanallah, imagine the, the jinn had like a, a grip of his throat and with every you know, session of ruqya, every time that we made ruqya, we recited this shackles, those shackles of the, of the shaitan, they were lifted. Until, alhamdulillah, by the end, the brother recited the Surah Fatiha, he recited the opening of Baqarah, he recited Ayatul Kursi, he recited the last three surahs of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured this brother. Ikhwani, some other points of benefit. As I mentioned in the last video, the shayateen, they are liars. They are liars, do not speak to them for more than you have to. Do not speak to them for more than you have to. Leave or I'm going to beat you. Leave or I'm going to kill you. Again, with the beating, with the beating, there has to be a disclaimer. Do not cause any harm. If you're hitting hard enough to bruise or anything like this, you're doing it too hard. All you need is gentle persuasion. Gentle persuasion is what we call it, but against the shayateen, by the permission of Allah, it's a serious and severe beating. You can also spray water on them, but again, ikhwani, all of these things are secondary issues. The core treatment should be recitation of Qur'an. Another reason why I really liked this, uh, or I was really grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to take part in this cure of this brother, was because this brother was doing so much for himself. Ikhwani, if I went to this person and he was not even praying, he didn't read Qur'an, I would make ruqya on him. I would, we would take two steps forward with the permission of Allah, but then after we left, we'd take six, six steps backwards because the person wasn't even praying. So one of the reasons why I believe after the permission and, and the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, why this brother, he was suffering very seriously, but why he was cured so quickly was because he had done the groundwork before us. He had done all of the groundwork before us. He went for as far as he could go. As much as he could do, he did. And then when he hit the brick wall, Ikhwani, he passed the baton over to us and we just put the finishing touches over onto his good work. So Ikhwani, if you want to make ruqya, if you think you're suffering with anything, if you're suffering with anything, be it a mental illness, be it a physical ailment, be it a disease of the heart, you backbite people, you slander people, you tell lies, you talk too much. Ikhwani, the Qur'an is a cure for all of these things. But don't pick up the phone to Araki until you have done the most that you are able to do yourself. So Ikhwani, from these two things, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them beneficial for us and for you. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us against the magicians and the shayateen. And I remind you brothers and sisters again of the first case, don't be careless when throwing things, don't be careless when running under trees, don't ever urinate under a tree because basically you're asking to be possessed. We find that the shayateen, a lot of the times they live under trees, near water, in uh, dirty places. Whenever you go to anything like this, if you need to walk through the park at night, take your precautions. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
بسم الله توكلت على الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله رسائي آية الكرسي أعوذ بكلمات الله حتام من شر ما خلق All of these things, Ikhwan, you can find them in Fortress of a Muslim. There are other books of Adhkar as well that you'll be able to find these things in. Stick to the narrations which are authentic and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will find that rather than us fearing them, the shayateen, the jinn, they will begin to fear us. Ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. and ages and on top of that we use water so what we would do is um, we would uh, you know subhanallah I don't know the effect of water what it what effect it has why it has this effect Allahu alam but from experience what we can say is that there are some jinnis who you'll spray them and they'll just sit there and they'll take it however there are others from amongst the jinn when you spray them it's like that water ikhwani just normal water it's like that water is like acid and it burns them and they scream but Ikhwani, again, let me remind you, the Qur'an should form 99% of your attack on the, sh on the shayateen or 99% of your ruqya session and 1% should be these other subsidiary things and these are just secondary issues. The primary thing that you do, Ikhwani, is you should be reciting Qur'an. Ikhwani, an amazing thing transpired when, uh, when I was reciting I want to share it with you because subhanallah, you know, we know that the jinn are real. We believe in the jinn. We believe in the world of the shaitan. Uh, we believe in the world of the unseen. We believe in the Quran. But ikhwani, we experienced this. We actually experienced the strength of the Quran by the permission of Allah. We were reciting and then I started reciting Surah as safat I don't know what effect or I don't know why this surah has such a huge effect. But it seems that Ikhwani, this surah, it really terrorizes and it really causes immense pain and problems for the shayateen. It's the 37th surah of the Qur'an. So we were reciting surah as safat i safa wa safat i safa And we were reciting, reciting, reciting and the jinn started screaming. And the jinn said, it's burning me, it's burning me, it's burning me. And the jinn said, everywhere that I look, there is fire. Subhanallah. Ikhwani, we were in the same room. We did not see any fire. We did not see anything. But the shaitan, he was saying, everywhere that I turn, there is fire all around me and it is burning me. Ikhwani, this is the strength of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we don't truly appreciate this Qur'an which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلٍ لَرَعَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِّنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ That had we revealed this Qur'an on a mountain, you would see the mountain humbled and exploding out of the fear of Allah. Ikhwani, this Qur'an which if it was revealed to a mountain, the mountain would turn to dust out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why don't we utilize it more? Why don't we make it a part of our lives? So Ikhwani, we continued that night and we made a huge amount of ruqya or we made a lengthy period of ruqya. I would make ruqya and then I would tell the other brothers I would take a rest and they would make ruqya. The other brother would take a rest and the other brother would make ruqya. And Ikhwani, what was my purpose for doing this? Not only was it to take a rest, but it was to show to the brothers that there's nothing special about doing ruqya. If you can recite Qur'an, you can do ruqya at least on yourself and your family. Not necessarily on the wider community, but if you can recite Qur'an, if your aqidah is correct, you have the capability to make ruqya, ikhwani. You have the capability to make ruqya and you shouldn't shy away from it. You shouldn't shy away from it because this is seeking cure for all of our illnesses and it will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we sought cure from a haram way, would we be punished? Of course we would. So what about when we seek it through a halal way? Of course we expect a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ikhwani, this was the, I think this was the, the third time that I visited the brother and we were making ruqya. And, the, and you know, the jinn was saying, okay, I'm going now. And again, he was blowing out and immense, immense blows, Ikhwani. The, the, how much wind was coming out of this brother's mouth. It, is, it wasn't human. It wasn't normal. It was not normal. 
And then Ikhwani subhanallah, the jinn would, his, the brothers again, the hardware is the same, his arms are the same, his shoulders are the same, his face is the same, everything is the same. But then his posture would change and his voice would change. And the jinn would say, now I'm a different jinn. That one has gone, now there's another one. I'm a different one. I am this one and this is this one, this one, this one, this one. And they told us their names. Again, it's not useful, I can't remember their names, Ikhwani. And then an amazing thing happened. Then an amazing thing happened. The brother suddenly, it was the brother again. And you can tell when it's the brother. And it was the brother and he started crying. And he started crying and he started glorifying and praising and you know asking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he made the prostration of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was crying in his prostration, Ikhwani. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured the brother. And walhamdulillah, Ikhwani, I never saw the, this brother in the masjid before this time. I never saw the brother in the, in the masjid before this time. But recently this Ramadan, I saw the brother and I used to meet him virtually every single night of Taraweeh and he was in the masjid and he was praying and Ikhwani, he would tell me that when he came to England before he came, he used to be very close to the Qur'an. His relationship with the Qur'an used to be very strong. But when he came to England and he got involved in the fitna and the fasad, he went away from the Qur'an. But walhamdulillah, Ikhwani, since then, the brother has become a strongly practicing brother. He reads Qur'an, he makes ruqya on himself and his family. The brother has um, volunteered. He said, when you go and make ruqya, if you need somebody to come, I will come any and every single time. And we see the brother in the masjid. Walhamdulillah, Ikhwani, a point of benefit here. At that moment, when the brother couldn't recite Alif, Lam, Meem, his life was at a very low stage. He was feeling low, he had no energy, he was dreaming of snakes, he would see things, he would experience things, he couldn't recite the Qur'an anymore. Ikhwani, this was a very low point. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْعُسْرِ yusra," That indeed, with every hardship, there comes ease. Ikhwani, now the brother, alhamdulillah, is going through a period of ease and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease the situations of all of the Muslims, wherever they are. Other things, other points of benefit. I gave the brother or I told the brother to um, take some laxatives because the magic was in his stomach. Ikhwani, when the magic gets into your stomach, it doesn't matter how many times you empty your bowels, you empty your stomach, the magic, it just has a way by the permission of Allah of staying in the person's stomach. It stays in the person's stomach. So what we did was we gave him some uh, advice to take some laxatives and walhamdulillah, this cleared out the magic from his system. I did go a couple of other times and there was remnants of the jinn after that but walhamdulillah, um, I went abroad and I came back and the brother was completely cured by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another point of benefit, ikhwani, like I said, the brother couldn't recite alif, lam, meem. So he would recite alif, lam and he would stop and then we would beat the jinn, we would make more ruqya and then I would say, now akhi recite. And he would be able to recite alif, lam, meem, thalikal. And then the jinn would come up again, start laughing or start crying or start screaming. And we would beat the jinn again. Again, I emphasize, beat the jinn, not beat the brother. We would beat the jinn again, we would make more ruqya and then we would continue and the brother would now be able to recite alif, lam, meem, thalikal kitabu la rayba fi. But he couldn't go on. So it's like, subhanAllah, imagine the, the jinn had like a, a grip of his throat and with every you know, session of ruqya, every time that we made ruqya, we recited this shackles, those shackles of the, of the shaitan, they were lifted. Until, alhamdulillah, by the end, the brother recited the Surah Fatiha, he recited the opening of Baqarah, he recited Ayatul Kursi, he recited the last three surahs of the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured this brother. Ikhwani, some other points of benefit. As I mentioned in the last video, the shayateen, they are liars. They are liars, do not speak to them for more than you have to. Do not speak to them for more than you have to. Leave or I'm going to beat you. Leave or I'm going to kill you. Again, with the beating, with the beating, there has to be a disclaimer. Do not cause any harm. If you're hitting hard enough to bruise or anything like this, you're doing it too hard. All you need is gentle persuasion. Gentle persuasion is what we call it, but against the shayateen, by the permission of Allah, it's a serious and severe beating. 
You can also spray water on them. But again, Ikhwani, all of these things are secondary issues. The core treatment should be recitation of Quran. Another reason why I really liked this uh, or I was really grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to take part in this cure of this brother was because this brother was doing so much for himself. Ikhwani, if I went to this person and he was not even praying, he didn't read Quran, I would make ruqya on him. I would, we would take two steps forward with the permission of Allah. But then after we left, we'd take six, six steps backwards because the person wasn't even praying. So one of the reasons why I believe after the permission and, and the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, why this brother, he was suffering very seriously, but why he was cured so quickly was because he had done the groundwork before us. He had done all of the groundwork before us. He went for as far as he could go. As much as he could do, he did. And then when he hit the brick wall, Ikhwani, he passed the baton over to us and we just put the finishing touches over onto his good work. So Ikhwani, if you want to make ruqya, if you think you're suffering with anything, if you're suffering with anything, be it a mental illness, be it a physical ailment, be it a disease of the heart, you backbite people, you slander people, you tell lies, you talk too much. Ikhwani, the Qur'an is a cure for all of these things. But don't pick up the phone to Araki until you have done the most that you are able to do yourself. So Ikhwani, from these two things, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them beneficial for us and for you. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us against the magicians and the shayateen. And I remind you brothers and sisters again of the first case, don't be careless when throwing things. Don't be careless when running under trees. Don't ever urinate under a tree because basically you're asking to be possessed. We find that the shayateen, a lot of the times they live under trees, near water, in uh, dirty places. Whenever you go to anything like this, if you need to walk through the park at night, take your precautions. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Bismillahi tawakkaltu ala Allah, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, recite your ayatul kursi, a'udhu bi kalimatillah hittam min sharri ma khalaq. All of these things, Ikhwan, you can find them in Fortress of a Muslim. There are other books of Adhkar as well that you'll be able to find these things in. Stick to the narrations which are authentic and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will find that rather than us fearing them, the shayateen, the jinn, they will begin to fear us. Ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.